you're going to take it seriously, which, you know, you could say why take it seriously. But if you are going to take it seriously, I don't think it's there to reward big commercial success. And I don't feel like Adele's 21 does anything that, you know, deserves to win the Mercury Prize. It doesn't push any boundaries. Calls into question the whole idea of what the Mercury is for once again. It's been number one everywhere. I think it's done something like eight million copies. So you sort of feel almost what's the point of her being on the Mercury list? And you might say that if Adele's on the Mercury list, then why don't you have sort of take that on the Mercury list as well? Non-kitsch, mellow, um, middle of the road music feels right all of a sudden. Uh, Rumour has had a very big year as well. I was actually wondering whether she'd be on there. Uh, but I guess Adele's been the bigger seller. It is a really well-realised album, very cleverly made album. You know, it's hip, it's not hip, it's young, it's old. Um, it's everyone really, but uh, you know, and yet it's a good record, which is the surprise. I try to push past, but he wants to play. So I sip his drink as I hold his game. Katie B's another artist, uh, like so many around at the moment, who went to the Brit School. She's in the year below Adele, I think, at the Brit School. Um, same year, or the year below Jesse J as well. Uh, Better to have Katie be on the list than Jessie J, I'd argue. I know she's described as dubstep, but to me, this is actually pop music. This is the kind of thing that, when girls allowed split up, one of them should have made. Katie B and James Blake both kind of a kind of mainstream pop orientated take on dubstep. I think the Katie B one's exciting. I'd like to see that do well, possibly win it. Uh, it's you know, it's got a lot of energy towards it. I think what she's done is, she's kind of take, taken kind of the UK urban scene and giving it a bit of a pop sheen. I can see why people kind of like that record. There's a limit to your love. The James Blake one, I think, is kind of the opposite of Katie B. It's, it's giving it a very drab kind of makeover. It's very kind of almost top man style version of dubstep. I think the problem that James Blake's going to have is that the XX won the prize last year. The XX, I mean it is a good record that, but it's it's quite mannered to my ears and there is something slightly precious about it. <laughs> it's a bit unfair on them and it's unfair on James Blake to say it's a sort of, it's a similar kind of record, but it's a similar kind of record. Calvi's got a completely distinctive artistic vision. She references everything from Ennio Morricone to kind of the more, more gothic side of things. She's very she's very focused and I think uh, I think her album kind of stands out from the crowd because of that. When Anna Calvi's album came out, one of the most immediate comparisons that lots of people made was with PJ Harvey, so it's gonna be quite tricky for her with, with Polly Harvey on the list as well. One thing that's very interesting is the lack of bands on the shortlist. There's eight solo artists, nine if you count uh, King Creosu, who made a record with John Hopkins. Um, two of the bands I grouped together would be Everything Everything and Metronomy, who've made perfectly fine albums, but I'd say they're just kind of averagely interesting indie rock records. Uh, Metronomy from a more dancey hipster angle and Everything Everything from the kind of the jerky indie side. Interesting, good to see live, um, not, you know, in a way kind of tickle the boxes, both of them for the Mercury, and that they are a little bit innovative. Uh, they're a bit cool, they could be rewarded by being exposed to this wider audience, but I'd be surprised if either of them were going to win this prize. They're both fine, but I mean, I, I just would not be excited in the slightest if either of them won the Mercury prize. Um, I, I just think the, the sound of British music in 2011 isn't really that. I don't know if 
Tiny Tempers okay. album it's okay. itself, in itself, actually merits inclusion, but he himself represents the coming of age of British urban music, and I think for that reason, it's nice to see him there. A while ago I was saying how good it seems to me that artists like Chipmunk and Tinshi Strider uh, and Tiny Temper are coming through because uh, if you compare the British pop scene today to the way it was 30 years ago, it is just more multiracial. There's, there's a wider range of influences there and it's quite heartening in a sense to see that all of those acts there. And this very successful label head just said, well, that's all well and good, but the music they make is absolute rubbish. And, you know, you're being a terrible uh, do-gooding uh, liberal guardian reader bending over backwards to accommodate uh, uh, your taste to, to what the kids are into and actually it's rubbish. And I understand what you were saying. Uh, <laughs> uh, and it would be untrue of me to say that I've listened to the Tiny record exhaustively, you know, seems a nice kid. King Crusoe and John Hopkins is an absolutely lovely, understated record. Um, kind of the whole concept is to have found sounds from this little fishing village in Scotland, kind of interspersed with the kind of King Creosote's kind of lovely melancholy folk songs. Uh, I am really, really pleased it's made the list because I think it's going to shine a bit of a spotlight on it. I'd love to see it win. I don't think it has a chance of winning, but, um, you know, it's great that it's on there. I have a drop leaf window With cats and broken yards Some flowers and paint cans Everybody loves Elba, just like everybody loves Jarvis Cocker. They are your favourite uncles, or <laughs> in my case, uh, my favourite brothers, probably, because uh, I'm old enough. But um, they, um, I, I think that um, Seldom Seen Kid, which won them a Mercury a couple of years ago, is actually a better album than Build a Rocket Boys. Everyone was so pleased, pleased as punch when they won it, and it was seen as a kind of reward for toiling away for years without the, the wider recognition that, that they deserved and they're, you know, they're terribly nice guys as well. The temptation for them after that might have been to go and make a much more commercial record that capitalised on that success uh, and kind of brought in all those people who might have picked up the, the record in the aisle at Tesco's um, and reel them back in again by doing something that was just straightforward. And this album isn't that. I mean, it is still a very left field, uh, often I think quite personal album uh, that demands you know, serious listening. Uh, and is none the worse for that, but I'm not really an Elbow fan, never have been. They're just one of those bands who I kind of like and admire and respect. I'm really happy for them, not for me personally. Ghost Poet's kind of an album that the Mercury Prize is set up to shine the spotlight on, I think. Um, a very interesting record, loads of different influences from kind of electronica, jazz, folk, grime, just all it's like a melting pot. Um, I know Mike Skinner is a big fan and he he promoted him on our website during his takeover. The thing about Ghost Poet is he's the only artist to reference a former winner of the Mercury Prize, Badly Drawn Boy's Hour of Bewilderbeast as a prime influence, which you know you don't hear bandied around as a kind of crucial influence very often. <laughs> He's a fantastic talent, been around for some time, although I think he's only still about 30. Um, this is a solo album, um, and you can see why comparisons that have been made uh, to the likes of Keith Jarrett before uh, are valid. Um, it, technically, he's incredibly gifted, and it is a uh, completely evolving record at the same time. I mean, his problem is, though, that he is the token jazz person this year, and there is always the token jazz person, and you feel like the token jazz person will never win. Harvey will be the first act to win the Mercury twice. Um, I don't get the PJ Harvey album, she's one of those critics favourites that completely passes me by, but I think the wind is blowing in her direction this year. PJ Harvey would be quite a, a smart bet, I think it's, it's almost a good story that she's won it twice, I don't think anyone's ever won it twice before, um, and I also think it's one of those kind of 
you know, fantastic albums that does kind of stand out a bit in terms of quality. It does feel like a really weighty kind of artistic statement. Recently, uh, the great American critic, Greil Marcus, was asked uh, which artist of the last 30 years uh, was the one that really meant something to him or that he really thought was the real deal. Um, and he picked out Polly Harvey. I think this record does have a certain immediacy to it. Uh, and I think that's both in the playing on it and the musicianship, but also in the subject matter. I mean, there is something incredibly powerful and compelling about the parallels that are drawn between uh, the Gallipoli uh, campaign and war uh, and what's happening in the world today. Uh, you know, she is a major artist and she is comfortable handling that kind of difficult territory and she does it without making it feel trite or dull. It is both a commendable record but also an incredibly listenable album.